in Hart from the Heidelberg University, and she will speak about graph embeddings in symmetric spaces. Yes, thank you very much. So I would like to uh, thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to this interesting workshop and also for um, accommodations. I had to switch uh, my uh, time slot for the talk uh, last minute last week. So thank you very much for accommodating this very last minute change. So what I want to uh, tell you a bit about in this uh, talk is about graph embeddings in symmetric spaces. So let me um, tell you basically what my plan is. I want to first uh, tell you a bit about symmetric spaces. What are their properties? Why, that, why are they uh, somehow good manifolds to uh, embed graphs? Um, and then I want to basically tell you about two works we did with this, so in two, specific examples of symmetric spaces, so-called Ziegel space and uh, SPD, so symmetric positive definite matrices. Uh, one work which is really focuses on graph embeddings and the second work which focuses more on, I mean, not so embedding graphs or more general knowledge graphs and using uh, the embedding for downstream tasks. So let me start by telling you uh, what is a symmetric space and what are uh, its nice properties. So the first, um, property, and this is why it's called a symmetric space, of a symmetric space, it's, it's a Riemannian manifold which has a lot of symmetries. And in particular, every point in your manifold gives you a symmetry, an isometry of your manifold. If it's associating to a point, you can look at the geodesic involution. So if you take a point which lies on the geodesic of distance t from the point p, you map it to the point T prime, which lies on the other side, if you would walk at P in the other direction on the geodesic uh, at distance T. And so every point gives you a symmetry. So you have a huge symmetry group. In particular, the group of isometries of symmetric space also acts transitively on the space. So you can map any point to any other point in the manifold. So every neighborhood of one point looks exactly the same as neighborhood of the other point. And we all know <clears throat> many examples of symmetric spaces. So the most uh, classical ones here in two dimension or but also any n dimension are the spheres, Euclidean space and hyperbolic space. But symmetric spaces can be much more uh, complicated and have more intricate structure. And in particular, there's a interplay for symmetric spaces between uh, negative curvature, non-positive and non-positive curvature. So I'm always looking at uh, symmetric spaces which are not uh, compact, but which are um, infinite. So they have either non-positive curvature or negative curvature. And so the negative curvature space, this is something, of course, we know um, perhaps very well in this example I already gave, for example, hyper, uh, the hyperbolic plane or more generally hyperbolic n space is a symmetric space and it has strictly negative curvature. So and from some perspective, some of far, from far away, it basically looks uh, similar to a tree. And in particular, if you look at how volume of ball grows, it grows exponentially. Conversely, we have, I mean, our <clears throat> flat symmetric space. So if we look at just the Euclidean space, this looks uh, more like a grid than a tree. And it also has polynomial growth. So if you look at the growth of balls, it grows like a polynomial in the radius of the ball. So symmetric spaces, and in particular, what are called higher rank symmetric spaces, combine these uh, two types of uh, behavior and two types of geometry. So these are remaining many manifolds which have non-positive curvature, but they definitely have uh, embedded Euclidean subspaces of a certain dimension and higher rank means that they have Euclidean subspaces which are isometrically embedded of dimension at least two. And so <clears throat> in these spaces, in this Euclidean subspaces, you see behavior like in Euclidean geometry, but at the same time, they contain hyperbolic subspaces, for example, where you see behavior uh, in hyperbolic space. And these are, um, somehow in this symmetric space combined in a, somehow, a very interesting way. So depending on which direction of the space 
in which direction you go, your space looks a bit different. And so it gives them rich geometry, but because they have this very rich symmetry group, they are at the same time still computationally tractable. And so this, I think, are the two uh, reasons which make them a really great target for uh, embeddings of um, graphs and for using when you when you try to use them to analyze and understand structure in data. So I want to give you <clears throat> now two examples of symmetric spaces um, in a bit more detail. But before I do that, I wanted to give you here the list. So these symmetric spaces up to taking products of spaces, they are completely classified. They can be written as uh, homogeneous spaces where you have a semi-simple Lie group model with a maximal compact subgroup. And I gave you here uh, on the right-hand side, the list of the classical uh, symmetric spaces. So there are also exceptional ones, a finite list of exceptional ones. And so they are all described as quotient of matrix groups. And in each of these cases, which are there in the list, you can ex compute explicit formulas for the distances, for the gradient of a function, for the exponential map, or also the logarithmic map. So the exponential map here is a, a diffeomorphism. Uh, you can compute concrete formulas, how isometries look like, how the Riemannian metric looks like, how geodesics look like. So it's very um, concrete and computational tractable. And now I want to give you a bit more detail on how the symmetric space uh, which is here called A1 looks like. So this is the space of positive definite symmetric matrices. And uh, then the space which is called in this table C1, which is called the Siegel upper half space. But let me first look at the space of symmetric positive definite matrices. So as I said, this is just uh, the points of your space are just uh, positive definite real symmetric matrices. So for example, the matrix two minus one minus one three, but then you can this is a point in the in the space SPD two, so in the uh, space of uh, two by two uh, positive definite real symmetric matrices. But it, this the the set has this nice structure of a Riemannian manifold of non-positive curvature and in particular of a symmetric space. So its dimension is just dimension of uh, the independent entries in a symmetric matrix. So it's n times n plus one uh, over two. It contains, I told you that it contains this uh, subspaces which are Euclidean. So for SPDN, the maximal dimensional Euclidean subspaces are of dimension N. And it contains hyperbolic subspaces which are isometrically embedded. And here the maximal dimension will be N minus one. And in some way, they really, as I said, combine this hyperbolic and Euclidean geometry. And you see this, I mean, as, as an example here on the right hand side for SPD2, this actually is, uh, they don't gain so much because this is just uh, homeomorphic to the product of H2 cross R. But in general, as soon as you go to SPD3 and higher, it will not be a product structure um, general anymore. So it will not be just a product of hyperbolic and Euclidean subspaces. And this is, I mean, using the space of symmetric positive definite matrices is not new in, uh, in data analysis. So this, these spaces have been used in many applications and many uh, questions. So uh, I think in particular, it's uh, used also often in medical image analysis because there sometimes you get your data already in the form of a symmetric positive definite matrix. And so it's useful to think of your data as a point in this space. Um, but what I want to show you is that you can use more structure of this space and um, other structure and really use the Riemannian geometry of these spaces in a, in a way which is not yet uh, ex exploited to its full extent. So I also want to give you an example of this other family of uh, symmetric spaces, which are called Siegel spaces. So these are less used, so I don't, uh, in, in data analysis, they perhaps appear uh, less often because the points in there are a bit, uh, already a bit more complicated object. So a point in this space is a symmetric matrix N by N with complex entries. And we have the uh, condition that, uh, and let me uh, show this, oops, sorry. 
went to the wrong direction, sorry. Um, let me show this here. So a point in the space is a symmetric n by n matrix of complex entries, where if you look at the imaginary part of this matrix, you require this to be a positive definite symmetric matrix. So here's an example, I, mean, I can write down many examples. So why are these Siegel spaces uh, interesting? So the first is if n is equal to one, it's just another um, model or I mean a copy of the hyperbolic space in dimension two. So either in this upper half plane model, which I described here, or you can also write down a generalization of the Poincaré uh, disk model. So for n equals one, it's just the hyperbolic plane. So in some sense, it's a uh, higher rank uh, generalization of the hyperbolic plane. It's very, um, I mean, it's very nice to write down formulas for gradients, uh, distances, and so on in these spaces. And what makes them in, in some situations even better than the space of positive definite symmetric matrices is that these Siegel spaces have a richer submanifold structure. So for example, in the Siegel space SN, you have product, you don't just have uh, hyperbolic uh, subspaces, you also have products of hyperbolic planes. So you have product of n hyperbolic planes uh, embedded isometrically. And um, as I said, I mean, gradient it has a very simple form because it's just uh, rescaling of the Euclidean gradient. So in some sense for implementation of things where, which you know how to do in Euclidean geometry, these are really good um, spaces. So now we want to bring these uh, symmetric spaces together with, um, with, with data and uh, in particular with graphs. So we um, model in trying to use these symmetric spaces to analyze data. We think of our data model as a graph and why do we focus on graph? Because it's one of the some ubiquitous ways to represent data and relation between data and uh, somehow this way they are used in many machine learning applications. And if you look at it, I mean, one important tool when analyzing a graph, of course, we know we can analyze it combinatorially. We can look at uh, structure on the graph, but it's sometimes quite uh, complicated due to its, this discrete structure. And so it's sometimes useful to take the graph, embed it into a manifold, and then we can use the ambient structure of this manifold to infer properties or structure of the graph. Um, by uh, looking at how our graph is embedded. And this is very classical um, for embeddings in Euclidean spaces. But in the past uh, 10 years or so, there has been a lot of interest in, or I mean, growing interest in also in embedding into more complicated spaces, for example, hyperbolic spaces, spaces of curvature, because many complex networks have inherent features of negative curvature and actually many graphs have not just, they are not, next, don't look like trees or grids, but they have uh, mixed features. And I want to sh just uh, pick out three uh, somehow works where hyperbolic geometry has been used. So hyperbolic plane, uh, just to give you a sh uh, short snapshot, one to um, embed the, I mean, basically, uh, connection network of the, of the internet and try to solve uh, routing problems in the internet. And in more recently in 2017 was a paper which uh, received a lot of attention where hyperbolic plane, hyperbolic geometry was used for uh, word embeddings and to infer uh, latent hierarchies in data sets. So now what I want to um, uh, tell you now a bit about is a general framework we describe to learn graph embeddings in more general symmetric spaces and um, how we implement it in Siegel spaces and later we come back to positive definite symmetric matrices and also highlight some of the additional geometric properties of the symmetric spaces we can use. Okay, so here's the first additional geometric property which I would like to uh, focus on, on a symmetric space. So we know that if we are in Euclidean space or hyperbolic space, if we have two points, the somehow relative uh, position of these two points up to isometries of the space is given by their distance. So it's given by a number, which gives us, which is the distance between these two points. 
if we are in a symmetric space, we have a finer way of measuring distances. Because if we have two points in a symmetric space, their relative position up to isometries is not determined just by a number, but it's really determined by a vector in a Euclidean space whose dimension is the rank of your symmetric space. So for example, for this uh, space of positive definite symmetric n by n matrices, this uh, has rank n. So if I give you two positive definite symmetric matrices, the relative position as two points in my, in my symmetric space is determined by a, by a vector in Rn. And so how can we think of this vector? So the, we can think of this vector as follows. So I can take one of the points. And since my, uh, I, I said the group of isometries of a symmetric space acts transitively, I can take this point A, my positive definite symmetric matrix, and I can move it to the identity matrix. So I can write it in a basis where it's the identity matrix. And then I can take the other matrix, positive definite matrix B, and by adapting uh, my basis by an orthogonal uh, transformation, I can move B to a diagonal matrix. So I move the pair AB to identity matrix and diagonal matrix, and the entries of this diagonal matrix uh, are, it, it will have real eigenvalues, lambda one, lambda two, up to lambda n. I can order them by, uh, by size. And this is my uh, vector value distance between A and B. So if we are in SPD2, so this looks like uh, we are have in R2 and if we order them by size, we just have this half quadrant in R2 and the right hand picture gives you a picture of where your vector lies on if you, if you work in SPD3. So why is this good? What's the advantage of not using just the Riemannian distance on a symmetric space, but using this vector value distance function? So the first is out of this vector, which you get from the vector value distance function, you can compute several metrics at the same time. So by just taking, this, you have now a vector in this Euclidean space of dimension n, by taking different norms of this vector, you compute different distances. So Riemannian distances or Finsler distances on the symmetric space. And so it gives you a way to not focus on one metric and we see why it's interesting in a minute, but look at basically all metrics at the same time. And the second advantage of this vector value distance function is that it provides much more information than just the distance or just the norm of the vector. But when you have the vector and not just its norm, you have more information on uh, somehow it's also its directions and where it lies in space. So you can read off, for example, regularity uh, properties of geodesics joining two points. And what I want to show you some uh, pictures later is you can also use it, this vector value distance function to visualize and analyze your embeddings of graphs in symmetric spaces. So let me, before I tell you how we embed the graph and what's the, uh, pipeline we use. Let me um, focus on uh, one point that we don't, so I told you that the vector value distance function is great because it computes all the distances at the same time. And in many situations, it's useful not to use the Riemannian metric, but a Finsler metric on a symmetric space when you look at graph embeddings. And let me give you an example of this, why sometimes the Finsler metric is better than the Riemannian metric just in, the, in R2 and the grid. So if we have the grid, just a uh, uh, standard two-dimensional grid, we expect this looks like R2, right? In a discrete way. But if we try to embed the grid with its graph metric into R2 with respect to the Riemannian metric, we will always have a distortion of at least square root of two because in the graph, we go left up, right? And in the, with respect to Riemannian metric, we would go uh, take the diagonal and the diagonal uh, has a different length than going along the side of the square. But if we take the L1 metric, so which is one particular Finsler metric, then, and we look at the L1 metric on R2 and compare it with the graph uh, metric um, on the grid, then we would, could embed without any distortion, right? So the L1 metric is in some sense makes R2 look even more like a grid or a grid more like a truth than, than the Riemannian metric. 
One thing which is not so nice about Finch's met metrics that they are not necessarily differentiable, they are not uniquely geodesic, they are not convex, so they're not so good for optimization. But in, in a way, what we do is that we use the Finzler metric when we construct our loss functions, but uh, use the Riemannian metric in the optimization scheme. And this way, combine the advantages of Finzler metrics with, in some sense, not taking uh, with us the disadvantages and taking from the optimization the advantages of the Riemannian metric. So now we want to take a graph and embed it in learn and embedding in a symmetric space. And how do we do this? So then we follow a standard uh, pipeline for that. So we pick just some initial embedding. So we put our graph into our symmetric space in some way. And now we want to optimize our embedding by running some stochastic Riemannian gradient descent with respect to some loss function. So for example, here's one, I mean, we can play a lot with the loss function. So here's one loss function, which in some sense optimizes for distortion, right? Where we um, compare the distance of my two embedding points in my space X with respect to the distance of these two vertices of the graph in the graph uh, metric. And then I take the ratio of the two distances squared minus one, sum this over all uh, pairs of vertices in the graph. and take this as my loss function. So this way we improve step by step our embedding. And at some point, uh, if, the, if after many iterations, this process stabilizes, we say, okay, so this is our final embedding. And then we want to use this embedding to perform cast or analyze the graph or in uh, somehow to, when we want to show that it works also to just say, okay, so what are the properties of uh, this embedding? And so in the next slide, I want to be now a bit more precise how we do this in, in the Siegel space, uh, where we apply this procedure for, I mean, the symmetric space being the Siegel space and use the vector value distance function and um, the Finzler distance. Uh, before I do that, I also want to give you somehow the metrics, the measures with respect to which we, in the end, want to analyze the quality of the embedding. And we use uh, two, uh, two measures there. So one is the distortion. So uh, to what extent does our, is our graph embedding uh, somehow similar to the distances in the graph? So if two, two points are close in the symmetric space after when we embed them, are were they also close in the graph? Vice versa. So what's the distortion? And the other is uh, the average precision. So to check whether close points in the embedding space were their neighbors in the graph or not. So in some sense, the first one is a global distortion and the um, second one is in some sense more local structure. And then we want to take our embeddings in symmetric spaces and compare them to model baselines. So to embeddings in Euclidean spaces and hyperbolic spaces uh, and also to, into Cartesian products uh, of Euclidean and hyperbolic spaces. And, we also have some uh, small comparison between embedding in Ziegler spaces and embedding in the space of positive definite symmetric matrices. So now we uh, come back to this embedding pipeline. So in order to analyze, in, initialize our embedding, we do something very uh, stupid. And I mean, we do, don't put in any information. So we just take our graph, take all the vertices of the graph and choose randomly points being close to one point in our symmetric space. So we put the all vertices in the graph, we, we send them in a small neighborhood randomly around i times uh, the identity matrix. So this is the point in our Ziegler space. Now we use the remaining gradient descent with respect to this uh, loss function so involving the, um, the metric in the symmetric space on the Ziegler space and the metric uh, in the graph. And here, for the metric in the Ziegler space, we want to experiment with different metrics. So not just the Riemannian metric, but also Finzler metrics. And so for this reason, what we do is in our uh, implementation, we don't compute the distance with respect to any particular such metric, but we compute the vector value distance. And then we can evaluate it on which norm we want to take. So on the right-hand side, you see uh, somehow explicit uh, algorithm, what you how you compute the distance. So you take two points in the uh, Ziegel space, then you have to 
uh, somehow put the, you basically want to put them to i times the identity and i times the diagonal matrix. And for this, it's, it involves a matrix factorization problem. And then you get the vector value distance function. And then you can compute the Riemannian distance by taking the I2 norm or a nice Finsler distance, uh, Finsler one metric by taking the I1 norm, or you could take the an infinity norm of this vector value distance vector. Okay, so what is the, what is in some sense one of or finite when we do this, and I will show you some tables uh, in a second, is that uh, if you do these graph embeddings into Siegel spaces, they really have much better representation cap capabilities without assuming any a priori knowledge of the internal structure of the graph. So what do I mean by this more precisely? So if you look at uh, first, as uh, models of, in some sense, synthetically engineered graphs. So you take the four-dimensional grid, you take trees, you take products, tree time a, times a grid, or a tree times a tree, or you take such a tree of grids or a grid of trees. And then you run this embedding procedure for different uh, spaces. So Euclidean space of dimension 20, hyperbolic space of dimension 20, product of dimension 20, SPD6, this has uh, what is uh, what has this as dimension? It's six times five over two, so this has dimension um, fifteen. And then the the Siegel space uh, of rank four, so this uh, has dimension four times three, so dimension twelve. So you compare those, and you see that in uh, in most cases the the distortion and mean average precision is much better for your embedding in the symmetric space. And you also see when you look at the table, so the R, F infinity, and F1 are the different uh, metrics. So the Riemannian metric, the Finsler metric coming from the L infinity norm, and the Finsler metric coming from the L1 norm. And you also see that in, in many cases, the Finsler metric significantly outperforms uh, the other metrics um, in this metric space. So we also, I mean, it's, so these are synthetic graphs, so they are somehow, in some sense, perhaps not so interesting if you want to really try to use this uh, to analyze real data. So we also ran experiments on uh, somehow real graphs from real world data sets. So USCA is a graph between PhD advisors and, um, and students. BioDCSUM is a graph which you get from genetic expressions and in which diseases they are, they occur. And then there are some uh, road networks and uh, the Facebook graph. And again, also in this real uh, world data set, you see that the uh, symmetric space, the Ziegel spaces outperform um, the other embeddings. And it was, I mean, partly to a really, uh, to a, to a really high amount. So it, it showcases that this Ziegel space don't just have strong records, construction capabilities for the somehow synthetic graphs, but also for real world um, data sets. We also then uh, use this embedding in uh, somehow a downstream task. So uh, for this, we chose a task which is basically comes from recommender system. So you want to embed a graph which is bipartite. So you have one are the users and the other side are the items and you have an edge if the user buys an item. And so you try to recommend items to uh, users, so it's basically what whenever you get the recommendation on Amazon, which is uh, used uh, before, and again, there, um, so the, the Siegel space outperforms the somehow constant curvature or product uh, baselines, and again, um, it depends now a bit on the data set. Sometimes the Riemannian metric is better, sometimes the Finsler metric is better. So, this gives you some, in some sense. Uh, um, idea and, and proof of concept that these embeddings in symmetric spaces are actually uh, useful and, and that the symmetric spaces with their more intricate and more complex geometry can adapt better to different um, uh, structures in the graph without putting in any a priori knowledge of what graph you have. Mm -hmm. Now I want to give you uh, another some advantage you get from embedding in this symmetric space, which is again an advantage of this vector valued um, distance function. Because now if I have an embedding in my symmetric space, I 
and I look at two vertices in my graph, right? I have not just their distance to look at, but I have this whole vector value distance vector to look at as, as somehow the measure of their relative position. And one thing I could, can do with that is I can use this to um, actually get a graph coloring of my graph after I embed it. And uh, we uh, play around here with the, this is the simplest uh, version. So when you are in the two dimensional, you know, if in rank two, so low, di, low dimension, so your distance vector is just a vector in R2. And so now we basically just now look at the angle this vector makes with a fixed direction and use this angle to uh, color the edges of our graph. So if, uh, if I take two points um, in my graph, sorry, no, I went back again, sorry. I don't know where I too shortly. Oh. Well, so here, yeah. so so you get this edge coloring, and so so if I mean I take the two vertices which are spanned by the edge, which, which give me the edge, and now I colored by the angle of this of this vector. So and you see quite nicely in the synthetic graphs, if you have a tree of grids, actually the tree-like structure is colored in a different color than the grids, and same if you have a grid of trees, come up by the just by this edge coloring where we don't put in any a priori information, you somehow see um, it picks out the different uh, structures in the graph. So more the more hierarchical structure versus the more um, the more well connected structure. And this is I mean I wanted to show you this uh, other example from this BioDZ sum data set. So also there you somehow see that these um, these clusters where we have uh, some sense very well connected part of the graph. These are colored uh, more bluish, so they they are embedded in different angle than the more underlying tree-like structure of the data set. And in the last picture here, I want to show you this is a picture which I had on the on the first slide. You can do this also with the Facebook graph, but the, of course this graph is so huge that it's it's much harder to see um, to to see something. Okay, so this was in some sense the first uh, part so where we really focused just on graph embeddings uh, and uh, taking the graph embedding in our space and trying to see whether we can embed it with better distortion, with better mean average precision and uh, use it in some very small um, task than, I mean, use the embedding in some very small task. So now I want to uh, tell you bit more about going one step uh, further. And this I want to show you in the, in the example of symmetric po positive definite symmetric matrices. So in many situations, you are not necessarily interested in just embedding your data in a, in a space, but then you want to perform operations on your graph or on your data set. And so one example is, for example, when you build a, uh, a deep neural network, I mean, in the input layer, you have your points and Usually we think of them as uh, lying in, I mean, vectors lying in, in some vector space. And when, then we do operations like adding up certain of the vectors. So uh, um, perhaps taking the mean, applying a linear transformation and um, to, to somehow operate on our, on our data and to get some output data on which we then can perform our task or read off some uh, classification problem. And so now the idea is that we can, uh, build, in some sense, we want to build similar operations, not on vectors in Euclidean space, but on points, when we think of our data sets as points in a manifold. And um, one of the um, ways this has been done in hyperbolic, uh, to do this in hyperbolic space, hyperbolic plane, in the machine learning community is what they call Juro calculus. So it's basically an algebraic formalism to translate Euclidean operations, just like adding vectors, subtracting vectors, multiplying vectors by, uh, by a scalar, and do these in other spaces, but in a geometrically meaningful way. And so this has been worked out uh, and, and uh, applied quite successfully in, uh, in hyperbolic geometry. And then I want to uh, 
uh, show you that you can do and um, build similar things in the space of um, symmetric positive definite matrices. So what does the, I mean, geometrically, there is not that much of a, of a gain in that. So basically what, I mean, what would you do, for example, in hyperbolic space, if you have two points at different points of your space and you would like to add uh, two vectors at different points of your space and you would like to add them, well, you cannot add them like this, but you have to parallel transport this vector in the same tangent space as this vector, and then you add them there. But what does make this Juro calculus nice for implementations is that basically, uh, once you write down geometric meaningful formulas in this way, someone who uh, wants to analyze data can use it as a toolbox. So he can basically take uh, certain algorithms, which uh, you know in Euclidean space, where you add and multiply and uh, vectors. And once you have the Juro calculus formalism, you can use them and just transport this, um, these formulas to, uh, the, to your other Riemannian manifold. So for example, to your symmetric space. So let me uh, just give you shortly the, the formulas. I mean, what, what we implement for the space of symmetric positive definite matrices. So you can, you know, your points are two positive definite symmetric matrices. You can add them, which is basically you multiply one matrix by the square root of the other from left and right. Um, when you do the subtraction, so it's basically adding the inverse. So you do the same with uh, the inverse of your symmetric positive definite matrix. You can you find some way of scalar multiplication, which you basically do by using the logarithm and exponential map. So you apply the logarithm map and put everything in the tangent space at the point. So there you have your linear structure, you multiply, and then you use the exponential to um, put these points back into your space. And uh, similar with a matrix scaling. So basically you can take, uh, take the logarithm, put things in the tangent space, then you have a uh, symmetric matrix, not, not necessarily positive definite. You can scale the entries uh, by a different matrix A, and then again use the exponential map to put things back in your space. You can also, the other things which we implement, because these are interesting and used in, in certain embedding problems and downstream tasks, is uh, to learn, uh, to have an efficient way to learn um, in your argument the rotations around a point or also reflections in a hyperplane. Okay. So when we have this somehow toolbox non algebra calculus, then we want to use this um, in uh, somehow embedding problems and downstream tasks, so uh, problems on, on graph completion and in particular knowledge graph completion. So what is the knowledge graph? So for knowledge graph, you don't only have the vertices and the edges, but basically you label the edges by certain relations. So for example, I mean, if you want to, I mean, you can use a knowledge graph to uh, model relationships between people, and then you have uh, two people. So, uh, and for example, you have the, the relation that uh, person one is the mother of person two, and then you would label the edge uh, by, the, by the relation. So in a sense, you look at even a directed graph. So you consider triplets of vertices, one vertex, which is the head, uh, an edge, which is the relation and the other vertex, which is the tail. And there's the H, R, and T for had relation and tail. And now you want to um, basically embed your knowledge graph, so embed your graph of the relation in a certain way in your uh, uh, symmetric space or arbitrary Riemannian manifold. And you want to use, I mean, basically optimize with certain functions. And here's one. Uh, function people usually use, which is in some sense you you assume that this relations of your knowledge graph should be uh, governed by a metric relation. So if you take if you think of your relation as a vector and you have the head as a point in uh, say to start in the classic case in Euclidean space, then you want that the head plus the relation is similar to the tail, perhaps up to certain biases which you which you add in your parameters you add in the learning process. Or you want the situation that, I mean, you, the relation gives you, I mean, you want to be, this, this would be just had plus relation should be close to the tail. 
but you might want to somehow move, rotate, um, or scale your head. So the, the vertex, which, which you imply as, as, as the head, you, want to, you might want to rotate this or scale or, or re use reflection. So this you can all do when you have this zero calculus toolbox. And so let me uh, show you what uh, uh, we did uh, for, um, so basically uh, developing this zero calculus toolbox for SPD. You can then uh, take, I mean, these are um, standard benchmark uh, data sets for knowledge graph, which basically also come from a bit this recommender system um, problems. And now you embed them and then you want to, I mean, basically what you, what you want to, um, what, the way you measure the quality of your embedding is, is HR, HR, HR1, HR3, HR10, is you basically look when you have a head and a tail and a relation, you look at the list from your embedding, which would be where you would say, okay, so this head and this tail is connected by this relation in my knowledge graph, and then you compare it. And if you, I mean, this hit rate at one, hit rate at three, hit rate at 10. So you make the list of the most likely relation of the most likely three relation of the most likely 10 relations, and you look how many uh, of them uh, are true. And so you again see that in, in many cases, uh, the, in particular for reflections and scaling this embedding in the symmetric space in SPD uh, outperforms Euclidean and hyperbolic um, models. And it does so in very, actually with significantly less uh, dimensions. So, um, so you can, you can re get really a gain of the complexity of your model in, I mean, you get a, a huge gain in the dimension of your space. And again, the Finsler metric, um, as you see in particular here, really outperforms the Riemannian metric. Yeah. So now um, you can also do something else now again with the, uh, with the vector valued distance function. So you have your, this embedding, you train the embedding, you want to, basically what you want to, you look at all triples uh, and you, Put them in three groups. So you have the training triples of true head tail relations. You have negative triples of triples which are not true. And then you have the validation triples on which you uh, somehow now look at how your embedding performs. And you can use the vector value distance function by uh, looking now at the vector between the true and the negative uh, head and tails to really see the learning process. So here, you see two examples where um, in the beginning, we embed our graph in a, again, random way. And now after five epochs, the, the training uh, triples and the negative triples almost look the same still. After 50 epochs, you already see how they separate. And after 3000 epochs, that's just basically when we stop our, our process, you see that, I mean, they are quite separate and you really, you can also then look where does, where do your validation triples lie? You see that in this visualization that it really correlates uh, very strongly uh, with the performance of your um, of your embedding of your then downstream task on the knowledge graph. So as I said, I mean this is this zero calculus toolbox is partly uh, one piece to actually go uh, a step further, and I mean this. We, we are still, I mean, we are pushing it even further in a, in a current project to really construct a neural network, which doesn't work on the Euclidean space, but on the space of symmetric positive definite matrices. So you really want to have basically the different uh, layers uh, so that you can build, put them together in a way that you can uh, construct a complicated neural net. And I mean, in this, uh, in the already published work, we did this with the uh, simplest version. So we have with this dual calculus linear layer where we can take do feature transformation, scaling, rotation, reflection. And then we use this to experiment on not just this knowledge graph completion, but also question answering um, problems. So basically what you do is you train word embeddings in SPD. Now then, you, then when you have the, your model, you want to use this to do question answer, ring. Right? And um, this you do by aggregating the uh, 
aggregating your points and then uh, adding again with some bias and developing a question answer similarity measure, which then you learn. I mean, these are partly parameters you learn and then you evaluate. And here again, I mean, I just want to show you the, uh, the table, the, if you compare with Euclidean and hyperbolic uh, space, uh, the benchmark data set, um, the uh, symmetric space outperforms all the baselines. And this is just a some of showcase of an example that you can build these linear uh, layers and more general neural nets on uh, space of symmetric positive definite matrices, well, but also more generally symmetric spaces, and that they are quite useful. So what I want to uh, end with now, just to summarize a bit, um, again, what I tried to talk about. So there is uh, the symmetric spaces, I think are a great tool uh, to explore in data analysis because they are have a much richer geometry than Euclidean and hyperbolic spaces, but at the same time are still very aggregately tractable. And so they're really good model geometries uh, for as embedding spaces. They have this nice combination of uh, Finsner and Riemannian metrics, which uh, sometimes give you, and playing with the Finsner metrics gives you much better performance. I try to show you that this tool of using the vector value distance function is actually gives you really a new edge on things which you don't have in Euclidean or hyperbolic spaces and can be quite useful to analyze your graph embeddings and uh, somehow putting things together so that you have this Jura calculus toolbox or more generally somehow uh, the different modules, if you want toolboxes to build a neural net is I think quite useful because then you can just basically use it as off the shelf and uh, uh, use it in, in all kinds of problems to analyze uh, data. And so since I come really more from geometry, topology, uh, geometric group theory and, and mathematics, I think there's still many tools and ideas which are not yet completely applied uh, in data analysis and where I think they're very interesting things to do in the future. So thank you very much. Well, thanks, Professor. Thank you for your excellent talk, and which I think is a beautiful conclusion of the whole conference. I mean, rounds things up very nicely. Any questions? Did I have a question? Yeah. Yes. So Anna, it's really fantastic talk. Yes, yeah. so, so nice. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned about this edge coloring in the in the middle, and then you show that there are like a tree template and the green template they use different colors. I'm trying to understand that is do what do you mean is actually you can actually uh, project the hyperbolic geometry component and also the Euclidean geometry component separately on the graph. Is that correct? Yeah, this is, I mean, I think this is in some sense a bit more than what we can actually do. So this is in some sense, the, I mean, this is, okay, so what the wish would be, perhaps, or dream, is that you could use this to somehow, for example, separate your graph and somehow say, without knowing anything a priori, when I have this image, I can separate my graph in different substructures. So I can say, okay, so this will give me the more tree-like structure, and this will give mm -hmm. me the more somehow well-connected part of the mm -hmm. graph. I mean, mm -hmm. this, I mean, what we do here is just heuristic, right? I mean, we just, we mm -hmm. do our embedding. We don't ask, in the embedding, we just ask for distortion. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just, our, our, our uh, objective is just to minimize distortion. But then mm -hmm. we, we uh, realize that in many cases, um, then if you do this simple edge coloring, Mm. idea. So this is really just by what, vec I mean, if you look at the vector value distance between two vertices, what angle does it make with respect to a fixed direction? You see in many examples that where you can, I mean, look at the graph and see the underlying structure, that it really captures some of it. So what mm. we didn't, I mean, but there's no theoretical, I mean, there's no, we don't have any theoretical certificate, right? Which tells you, okay, so if you embed in the symmetric space and you do this edge coloring, it will always work. So this is really just the uh, beginning. So it's, I mean, we have just examples where it seems to work. And where I think it's an interesting question whether, um, yeah, whether you can actually make it uh, work mm -hmm. also on a theoretical basis. But the idea mm -hmm. is that in the symmetric space, if you, I mean, if, so you have different, if you have a tangent vector, it has different regularity, 
mm. in a sense. And um, if you are in a, it's a so now depending on which regulatory it has, it can lie in different sub manifold. So this mm. is why you expect from the angle, the angle mm -hmm. tells you something about the regularity, that mm. from the angle you would get some information on in which sub manifold you embed your graph. Mm. Mm. Yeah, uh, actually, I'm trying to say I connected to maybe that cultural type of representation. So you see here, it seems that the yeah, quite consistent with the cultural representation. So yes. you have the yes. read part is like zero culture, and then the this part, and then the tree like part is more like a natural culture. Yeah. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then another following question is: Have you done some classification? So you have different uh, graph structures you embedded in the same. Uh, physical space, uh, signal space, and uh, can you try to do some classification or class uh, clustering of these things? Classification, so of different graphs, so to somehow. Yes. So yes. the graphs, no, this we didn't look at all. So, I mean, to, to some say we class, I mean, we, not really. I mean, we, I don't think we, nothing what we did really goes in this direction. I mean, we did, when we did these experiments, I mean, I can also tell you some of the graphs don't, I mean, there are mm. graphs which are particularly bad when you embed mm. in almost any space. So we'll so-called expander graphs. We, we mm. were hoping that perhaps there you would also see a significant gain when you embed them in symmetric spaces, mm. because they sometimes can be constructed using symmetric spaces. But they, mm. they expander graphs embed really badly. So it's always high distortion, basically no matter what target space uh, you look like. But I there's see. some classification. I mean, we, there's one thing we are working currently working on is uh, to build better classifiers in this space. So this mm -hmm. is, I told you, SPD has been used by other people before. But then, for example, when you want to do a classifying task in the end, mm -hmm. the classifiers people used always go back to uh, putting it in Euclidean geometry. And there is. There are very nice ways you can somehow build classifiers which are really really live in this metric space and not putting it back into some big dimensional Euclidean space. And so this is something we are currently working on, but this would be more a classifier to then, in the end, when you build such a neural net, in the end, give you uh, somehow an answer: is this uh, is this this object or? A, or not, or is there a link in the graph or not? I mean, it is for more for this classification task. Mm, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. Very interesting talk, yeah. May I, may I follow up with a small question? You talked about, you mentioned the fact that expanders embed very badly. Could you conclude, I mean, or it's too much to conclude that expanders are inherently non-geometric in nature somehow? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it's, yeah, I, I mean, we just did a few experiments. So I, I mean, at least from uh -huh. what we did, I do, cannot conclude that they are on it. No, I, I think, I think, I, I mean, it's something I would like to explore perhaps at some point in the future, but because they are, if you know, I mean, they're construction of expanders. Nowadays, most of the construction are random, randomized construction, right? If you build a random graph with this and this thing, you have a high probability that it's an expander. But some of the first construction of expanders really use discrete subgroups of the isometry groups of these higher rank symmetric spaces. So Margulis' uh -huh. work on yeah, expanders yeah. really use the geometry uh, um, and representation so theory of these of these spaces. And yeah, those are so, no, I mean, yes, in that yeah. their yeah. parent space, so to say. Yeah. Uh, okay, thanks. That's very nice. So, sorry, I mean, it's just I didn't concretize my question well enough. It was just a follow up, as I said. So yeah. Yeah. It's interesting to think about it. Thank you so much. Excellent, beautiful talk. Thank you again. And let's thank, thank the organizers for the idea and the effort to bring us together to show so many different facets of the same thing and com comprehensive and yet diverse and still unitary conference around very related ideas and which helped each of us to learn much more about this tangent fellow, so to say. So let's thank the organizers. Thank you.